kan daar een is bij eerst een ultima mensen. Dus ja, voor die zin heb ik gesproken. Falar em português, o professor Eder Guest percebe o português e, portanto, é para também nós podermos falar com ele em português. Ele não vai fazer a comunicação dele em português, mas se nós falarmos com uma dimensão clara, ele percebe claramente o português. É com imenso prazer que nós o temos aqui. Nesta, nesta conferência e nesta sessão de fecho, como, como também saberão, ainda, ainda hoje, porque aí é que o, o bloco provavelmente será concluído. Teremos uma sessão assim até cá às nove e meia, onde será exibido o filme do professor João Mário Grilo, Os Olhos da Ásia, e depois haverá ainda uma conversa entre o professor João Mário Grilo sobre Jorge Santos Alves, uh, mas é, aqui na, na faculdade é, é a nossa última sessão. O professor Aidan Guest é professor na, na, na Universidade de Harvard, uh, também uh, nessa universidade tem, uh, portanto, papel de ser o diretor do Harvard Film Archive. Uh, ele tem uh, sido responsável pela pela programação de, de ciclos na Fianal, o Bauhausen Film Festival, também uh, o, o programa que certamente se saberão que aconteceu na Bulbenta e que entre 2013 e 2015 o, o Cinema Dialogues Harvard é da Bulbenta. Uh, não, não vou estar uh, a ler toda, toda a apresentação, também acho que é que é importante referir uh, que se encontra atualmente a, a preparar um volume sobre uh, o cinema português pós-74 uh, e, e também uh, não deixa de ser uh, relevante que uh, produziu uh, o primeiro filme da Sumi e o Songs from the North, que foi uh, premiado uh, em mais do que um mais do que um festival e que, segundo sei, também é, é, está atualmente a produzir, se quiser poderá, poderá falar sobre isso, está a produzir o segundo filme da, da Sumi e eu, é, aliás, nos últimos meses é, esteve fora dos Estados Unidos também, é, por essa razão. Eu é, não vou demorar mais, nós estamos um pouco atrasados e passava a palavra para o professor Edgar Guest, de novo agradecendo muito uh, por estar aqui com Boa tarde, está bem? É. Boa tarde, muito obrigado ao Bruno e Caterina e, e toda a faculdade da Universidade uh, para esta, uh, esta invitação. Uh, não vou falar em português porque, uh, tristemente, em português não. Ainda não tem esta flexibilidade e profundidade para uh, explorar esta com a uh, subtilidade e necessária para falar sobre estes filmes de João Pedro Rodrigues e João Pedro da Mata. Então, em inglês. So, beginning with Alvorada de Melia, 2011, to find its most prominent expression. Hey, Mark, não, não se preocupe, vou falar. Uh, Uh, essa e claramente mas se não entender uma coisa posso ver beginning with Alvarado Ben Melia 2011 finding its most prominent expression in Ultima Vez que via Macau a new direction seemed to be taken by João Pedro Rodriguez now working as co-director with João Pedro Uh, de Mata, the art director of all his films since his 2000 debut feature, O Fantasma, and now working for the first time in the mode of documentary inspired cinema. Further distinguishing the series of films that continue with Mahjong in 2013 and Yeklong in 2014 was the fact that these were all filmed 
in Africa, <coughs> principally in Macau, or in Asian communities within Portugal. The series, in truth, must be traced back to the first work co-directed by the previous Guerra de Mata, which was just discussed by one of the panelists, a 2007 short film, China China, written by uh, Guerra de Mata, which follows an eventual, an eventful and ultimately tragic day in the life of a young Chinese immigrant in Lisbon. We must also add, as a coda to the series as it now stands, it's still continuing, the very short Alegria de la Provenza, the tribute, uh, solely directed by Rodriguez to his teacher in film school and mentor in cinema, Paulo Rocha. Well, I want to recognize and understand the singularity of the Asian films and the image of Asia offered by co-directors Rodriguez and Guerra de Mata. I would also like to historicize and contextualize the series by situating them first within the larger oeuvre of Rodriguez, and second, in relation to a certain tendency that I'd like to identify and consider in key works of contemporary Portuguese cinema. And this is a marked orientation towards the historic past and towards often distant chapters and sites crucial to Portuguese history, especially the nation's past status as the seat of a vast colonial empire spanning the globe. This gravitation to Portugal's past history is often, this is essential, accompanied and channeled through, I'd like to argue, a self-referential and distinctly cinephilic gaze, a fracturing of the image of the past through the lens of film history. With this in mind, I want to examine the Asian films in João Pedro Rodriguez's cinema in relationship to two contemporary Portuguese directors who significantly share this frequent and cinephilic orientation towards the past. Both uh, well-known, one side the older, one side the younger than Rodriguez. I'm speaking here of Pedro Costa and Miguel Gomes. Although Rodriguez, Costa, and Gomes today remain the most internationally recognized and acclaimed Portuguese filmmakers, they are rarely considered together, most often only loosely associated on the festival circuit as examples of equally renowned uh, compatriot artists. In addition to the frequent turn in key films of these directors towards the historic mythical past, these directors share a cinephilic orientation that I want to consider, I want to really consider the central role in their work of cinephilia. I want to speak here, though, of cinephilia not in the way that is most traditionally defined as a way of simply viewing, thinking, or writing about them, or to quote João Bernardo Costa, who succinctly describes cinephilia as a life organized around the viewing of films. Instead, I want to think about cinephilia slightly differently, as an orientation that can guide not only film criticism and spectatorship, but filmmaking itself. In this way, I would like to consider these three Portuguese directors as each and together embodying a specific mode of filmmaking that engages profound yet deeply personal knowledge of cinema in order to critically engage film history and cinema itself as a mode of history, as a kind of historical imagination. Cinema, cinephilic filmmaking is fueled then by not only that essential desire of the cinephile to grasp the elusive object of cinema, and I always think here of that scene in the 400 Blows where the young Antoine Buenel and his friends snatch uh, uh, from the, the lobby of the theater uh, film stills. It's that desire to possess, to grab, to hold, to keep, uh, uh, whether an actual or in the form of a memory, the cinematic image that I think is, 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 is quintessentially at the most, I think, um, traditional and some ways limited idea of, of cinephilia. So not simply this desire, though it's still there, but also a desire to understand cinema as a unique mode of history that intertwines and renders vivid both intimate and unstable autobiography and the always ambiguous myths of national identity. To speak of cinephilia as an emblem and guiding spirit of a national cinema is, of course, a familiar theme and strategy for film historians, especially when one speaks of new cinemas. Uh, be it the Nouvelle Vague, the New American Cinema, or the, the Taiwan New Cinema. Often the filmmakers of these movements offer open homages within their films of the cinematic models they admire and also seek to surpass, marking a critical distance through creative re reinvention of image, narrative, and genre. Like the Nouvelle Vague filmmakers, 
Uh, these are the three Portuguese directors I'm considering here are all children of the Cinemateca, although in this case, of course, the Cinemateca Portuguesa under the direction of uh, Jacques Bernard de Costa. Like the young uh, French Turks, these three Portuguese directors are also uh, marked by an obsessive dedication, especially in the early parts of their career, to celluloid film itself as a medium, and in a dedication to the most traditional ways of shooting and conceiving of the image in terms of light and shadow. And yet, the parallel ends there. For today, and in no recent time, are we seeing or discussing anything on the scale or with the kind of unity that might suggest, in Portugal, a movement. We are not talking here of a new Portuguese cinema, nor should I think that term should be applied. In fact, quite the opposite. I think the mode of cinephilia, or cinephilic filmmaking, embraced by the Portuguese, uh, contemporary Portuguese cinema, embodied by Rodriguez, Costa, and Gomes, specifically resists being a united movement, and instead embraces an explicitly individual and highly personal mode of narrative cinema, colored by a deeply personal connection and engagement with film history. The similar trajectories of the three filmmakers actually moves away from the romantic, dizzying melding of cinephilic references up to, to cine cinema past, and especially the embrace of almost anachronistic genres that we associate with the Nouvelle Vague and its legacy, so from Truffaut to, to Leo Carax. We see this in, in their early films, their first films, I should say. Consider Gomes' uh, debut feature, the 2004 Carrequet Menezes, with its fusion of Jack Rebet, Walt Disney, and Stanley Donnan, or Costa's Osanga, with its poetic reinvention of Charles Lawton as director, not actor, Nicholas Ray, and F.W. Murnau. Or consider a phantasma with its melding of Foyard and poster of Rossellini neorealism. These first films were all driven by a youthful energy and bold, ultimately unsteady embrace of utopian narratives and genres, the fairy tale, the romance, the chase film, the promise as a kind of resolution that the films also recognize is no longer possible. This gradually gives way in these, in these filmmakers' work to radically different kind of cinema that moves the furthest possible from any idea or semblance of narrative or genre unity. A move that culminates for Gomes and Costa in anti-epic trilogies centered upon the working class as a different kind of collective hero. I'm speaking here then, of course, of Gomes's As Milis Humanoid and Costa's Fontinas trilogy, which each, I think, try to understand and adapt the point of view and spe specific experiences of the displ displaced and dispossessed, or as Gomes calls them, the disenchanted. In order to do so, each filmmaker explores choral ideas, uh, voices, multi-voices, <coughs> and fractured narratives, a, a tendency which is extended and radicalized even further than Kostya's most recent work, Horse Money. This decentering and destabilization of narrative and of genres shares clear affinities, uh, important connections with the Asian films of João Pedro Rodriguez and João Rodriguez de Mata, especially when they are considered, as I think they must be, as a multi-part project. While I'll focus right now slightly more on the arguably most important of Rodriguez and Guerra de Mata's Asian films, Ultimo Res de Macau, I also want to consider the series as an integral, though a multi-part work, appreciating the way each of the films return differently to similar themes, places, and at times strikingly similar footage, if not the same footage. The constant reinvention signals the rich instability and polymorphous nature of the image of Asia in Rodriguez and Guerra de Mata's ongoing project. Defining the seven Asian films as a multi-part work makes a further connection between the cinema and Rodriguez and that of Costa and Gomez, whose own film, oh, I read it. Um, well, no, actually, whose, whose own films have steadily gravitated towards this idea of the multi-part. The multi uh, if we want, if we, we can, See here that Costa's celebrated Fontenelle's trilogy and Gomes's As Mil in Humanoids further share with the Asian films a similar refusal of any logical narrative structure, privileging decentered, destabilized narratives, preferring choral and dialogic uh, voices. For Costa and Gomes, the goal here is ultimately a radically democratic image, able to give equal voice to those not represented, those without a voice traditionally within the cinema. 
I would like to suggest the multiplicity of contrasting at times conflicting perspectives on Asia presented by the separate Asian films to be one of the most remarkable and most important accomplishments of these films, which together present and critique a veritable catalog of different images and ideas and imaginations of the East that have been invented by the cinema and have continued to shape the popular imagination of Asia around the world. If it is, if a kind of cinephilia is legible across the recent films of Rodriguez, Kost, and Gomez, then it is, uh, it is a cinephilia, uh, by, it is a cinephilia and by extension cinema itself as a mode of memory and nostalgia, a kind of longing, perhaps I love. A longing perhaps for the kind of narrative certainty and stability that once seemed possible or at least seemed to be promised in the classical cinema, whose narrative was defined by such stabilizing forces as enforced uh, censorship codes and streamlined industrial production. What emerges, I think, is a radical tradition of cinephilic cinema that at times approaches a kind of counter cinema. For in the films of Rodriguez, Gomez, and Costa, we do not find the kind of dense network of references to films past at work in the postmodern citational mode of cinephilic cinema at work in the films of such American auteurs as, for example, Tarantino, the Coen brothers, and Meta Wes Anderson's, a mode of cinephilia that often, it, it, it often borders upon the parodic and the ironic. Instead, within the Portuguese, these Portuguese filmmakers, I think we find evocations of cinema past that return not simply to past history, but to earlier modes of cinema, as, as earlier ways of seeing and understanding the world, both problematic and uh, representing promises unrealized. We could say that for Rodriguez, Costa, and Gomez, classical cinema, and classical Hollywood in particular, privileged object, after all, of the first wave of cinephilia, exists as a kind of memory, a kind of consciousness, a kind of willfully compromised, it somehow, because of its self-declaration of open desire, a truer and more authentic history. In the case of Rodriguez and Guerra de Mata, however, I also want to consider the Asian films as exploring and embodying an alternate and deliberately errant mode of cinema, cinephilia, a mode of queer cinephilia that still embraces cinema as a mode of desire, but also embodies the same shape-shifting illogic not logic, but illogic, a polymorphous desire that drives all of Rodriguez's narrative features from O Fantasma to his most recent O Ornitologo. The Asian films are driven by an equally unstable desire prone to shape-shifting perversions, but a desire rather for narrative in its many different forms, be it memory, storytelling, or what we might call traditionally history with a capital H. In order to further contextualize and historicize Asian films and to find a revealing link between Rodriguez and his contemporaries in the Portuguese cinema, I need to briefly mention uh, two important figures, I think two very important, two of the three. And the first is a name from, that uh, we've been discussing here, Paulo Rocha, who was a teacher and mentor of sorts to all three, um, and has always already been discussed at length here. The second figure is Antonio Peix, who played a similar role as mentor and teacher, both Costa and Rodriguez. Both Rocha and Reyes found inspiration in Portugal's distant and mythical past, in the case of Rocha, of course, in the Far East. If we were to trace a deeper history of Portuguese cinema's engagement with an intertwining of history and myth, then I think we, would, we could begin by speaking of the absolutely formative experience for both Reyes and Rocha, going back here another generation, of working as assistants for Manuel de Oliveira on his pioneering ethnographic docufiction, Acto de Primavera, um, in, in his work together with psychologist and filmmaker Margarita Cordero, Antonio Reis defined a different mode of creative documentary, a kind of ethnography of the imagination, realized first in his stunning and short film Jaime from 1973, a haunting portrait of a schizophrenic and deceased patient at the Miguel um, Bombarda Psychiatric Hospital, told through photographs and the striking artwork prolifically created by the artistically untrained Jaime Fernandez. Considered one of the key documentaries of Cinema Novo, Jaime is both an elegiac portrait of the artist as outsider and visionary, and an exploration of cinema as a unique tool for fathoming and mapping the human imagination. Facing Cordero ambitiously sought to tap 
this potential of cinema by exploring an even more elusive subject in their next film, and arguably their masterpiece, Trashos Mont, which returned to the same eponymous region Christ had first visited with Oliveira, now to render a kind of poetic ethnography of the folkloric imagination of Portugal's, Portugal's remote northern hinterland by interweaving stories, poems, and myths with evocative imagery of the landscape and portraits of the people themselves. As young emerging filmmakers, Reis and Rocha dedicated themselves to a new kind of national cinema whose films would assemble a kind of cinematic museum, as they called it, of the most vital and authentic and underappreciated aspects of Portuguese culture and daily life, most notably those absent from the dominant cinema of the South South dictatorship. Throughout Pedro Rodriguez's 2013 short film, O Corpo de Alfonso, reveals the director to be similarly invested in alternate modes of documentary as a tool for exploring the intertwining of Portuguese history and myth. Against a green screen, a series of rather used for similar effects, as we're discussing in the Hollywood version of my character earlier, um, against <coughs> Against a green screen, uh, a series of amateur bodybuilders are asked questions about the first elusive king of Portugal and asked as well to wield an enormous heavy sword, an overdetermined symbol of regal and masculine power. In ultimately touching and gentle film, O Corpo de Afonso unwinds a speculative fantasy about the mythological past upon which is superimposed the, are superimposed the individual stories of the young men's struggles in a time of economic distress. Superism imposed as well as a distinctly homoerotic uh, imagery of ample male bodies, the muscular male bodies, the body of the nation here as an object of desire. The intertwining of the mythic, the personal, the erotic, together with official history, is, of course, a key strategy of work in Ultima Vez, KV, Amakao, and the entire series of Asian films. In order to suggest a link between Paolo Rocha's cinema and that of Rodriguez, we need to go no further than a film by Rocha already discussed at length in this conference, a uh, second film about Enzlao Moraes, Ilia do Moraes, which uh, Jose uh, Bertolos already um, uh, discussed in his revealing talk. But here, this is a film that offers a revealing companion piece to his better known period piece biopic of Moraes, Ayulia da Somorias. Crucial to the second film, this documentary, is a superimposition of Rocha himself upon the figure of Moraes, transforming the film into both a portrait of Moraes and a self portrait of Rocha that suddenly um, uh, meditates upon Rocha's own career trajectory and his own fascination with Japan, which led him, like Moraes, to a government post as cultural attaché to Japan. I draw attention here to the striking insertion into Ayulia de Moraes of a highly personal dimension. Here, Rocha's own desire, his own time spent in Japan. The film thus pointedly ends, rather abruptly, I should add, with a female monk asking Rocha to speculate about which of Moraes' two lovers the filmmaker would have chosen if he had that choice. A charged, erotic situation that Rocha seemingly refuses by claiming not to have a preference, but nevertheless leaves as an ambiguous, open ending, closing then with the specter of unfulfilled desire. In this way, I think Ayulia de Moraes just points to one of innovative and lyrical mode of documentary whose intertwining of the personal and, and the uh, political could be seen as an anticipation to different registers simultaneously at work in the Asian films. And now to, to discuss the Asian films, um, according to its co-directors and co-creators, Rodriguez and Vieira de Mata, the first concept of the film that will become Ultima Vez que via Macau, on the fire of the projection now. was a documentary essay about João Rui Guerra de Matos' return to the Macau that he had known during his many years living there as a young boy, whose family followed the path of his father's appointments as an officer in the Portuguese Navy. Only gradually over the course of three filming trips to Macau was the concept transformed into something else. 
That something else is, of course, an openly hybrid film animated by a restlessly transformational logic kept alive across um, the entire length of last time I saw Macau, which has often been commented and commented here in the most recent presentations, is marked by a constant shift in direction and tonal registers, seeming at times almost about to become a different film. In this way, what begins as a low-budget, noir-inspired detective mystery gives way to a sort of personal home movie, a recherche to temps perdu, while continuing to weave alternate strands of dystopian science fiction or slightly dyspeptic intellectual, cultural, and other. Okay. Did you choose that? Yes. The film, the, op the opening of Ultima Mist, Kiria Macau, is, is crucial, I think, to any discussion. So I'd like to begin uh, there. Yet this opening is merely a playful non-striptease on many levels. We know the way it begins in dark, and then there's a, there's a revelation of, of, the actual, of the act itself. A non-striptease on many levels. For while On Whitter, To Die Like a Man is a film very much about performance and the performative dimensions of both masculinity and transgenderism as lived by an aging transsexual drag queen, Macau is instead a film that abruptly refuses the kind of, and explicitly refuses the kind of corporeal presence and polysexual bodies and covenants that are so central to To Die Like a Man and to Rodriguez's previous features, Odette and O Fantasma. Quite the contrary, Macau instead offers its principal characters as corporeally abstracted and fragmentary entities who appear most often, usually only as gloved arms glimpsed, reaching in from the edge of the screen. Indeed, after such a bold first appearance, the double absence of Candy's scratch from the rest of the film is notable. Candy never appears again in person, and is only heard as a breathless voice on the end and on the on the end of the phone, and as a voice are uh, re reading her last <coughs> letter to get the matter. And she is, of course, tragically killed towards the film's end. Her glaring absence as a body, as a corporeal presence, calls attention, however, to something else, to the fact that the polymorphous transformational desire that she embodies is nevertheless present and active throughout the film itself. It is precisely here that I think the Ultima Vesca via Macau makes one of its most daring moves, declaring itself to be a different kind of queer film, no longer concerned with a shape-shifting, endlessly bifurcated, and ever-displaced desire of Rodriguez's changing characters from the omnivorous garbage collector in O Fantasma whose desires encompass the homosexual, the heterosexual, and even the seemingly animal, to the eponymous heroine of Odette who seizes the haunted role of a young man's dead gay lover. Instead, Ultima Ves Kevin Macau offers itself as one of the queer and changeling bodies invented by Rodriguez's cinema, animated by restless shifts and metamorphoses that reinvent the film many times over in terms of image, narrative, genre, and tone. While Ultima Vesca via Macau and the Asian films are rarely considered in light of Rodriguez's other works, most often treated apart and seen in relation to the genres that they reference, 
Uh, I think it's crucial that these films are absolutely crucial to the place Rodriguez within contemporary queer cinema is defined by such directors as Chai Ming Man, Alan McGeerdy, and Christophe Honoré. But what, what unites all of these filmmakers is a deliberate turn away from the representation of queer characters and bodies and stories, but instead an embrace of a kind of what we could call queer logic, or rather illogic, driven by constant and restless transformations. Uh, take, for example, Chai Ming Lang, still most of Taiwanese filmmaker, still most controversial film, The Wayward Cloud from 2005, in which a watermelon playfully uh, floats as an open and highly sexualized symbol of the essential strangeness of the corporeal self, the flesh of the body, male, female, polysexual. Or take Alain Giridi's Le Bois de Davation, in which a middle-aged gay man is essentially kidnapped and taken on a delirious road trip to nowhere by a young woman of indeterminate sexual orientation. At the heart of Liang and Giridi's startling yet frankly declared inversions of normative sexual formulas long imposed by cinema, both straight and queer, we see the emergence of new narrative and genre forms of a new kind of polyvalent and elusive image, like the slippery melon that punctuates the way with cloud. One could argue that the instability and fluidity of the image in contemporary queer cinema marks a turn against the Manichaean politics of representation that previously defined queer cinema, the capital Q, the capital C, is simply that cinema which represented that which was not, that which was not heteronormative, but cinema which provided an ultimate and much needed a space for sexual, this kind of imagery. A number of important clues to such a queer dimension of Ultima Vesca of Macau are immediately delivered in its striking opening sequence. We know, for example, Candy's choice of the traditional iconic body-hugging Chong Song dress as a prop that boldly announces and embraces a glaring divide between East and West, with Candy's voluptuous transgender form playfully embodying the impossibility of performing Asianness as a regular practice during the time of the classical cinema, and as we've been discussed a number of times, of course, making a reference here to the same dress worn by Jane Russell in the uh, in. Uh, von Sturberg and Nicholas Ray's uh, Macau. Um, and in the classical cinemas, we know that we've also featured the uncomfortable spectacle of prominent actors from Catherine Hepburn to John Wayne and congressly performing yellow faces as called roles. Right away, then, we see the last time I saw Macau acknowledging, yet also refusing, the kind of Orientalist Asia so central to the history of dominant cinema. More than simply a willful counterpositioning against the classical cinema, Candy's performance of Asianness is also the first of a series of contrasting cinematic images and imaginations of Asia that are carefully and critically assembled across Old Dumovets TV Macau. Here is the image of Asia then as disguise, as costume, as performance, as moreover cross dressing. The key to the performative image offered in the film's opening is a deliberately bad lip syncing of Jane Russell's rendition of You Kill Me. The role of the voice in the film as artificially placed over the image is here underscored, revealing the voiceover as a cinematic construction, one equally important, of course, to traditional documentary, with the voice of God, or classic film noir, noir in which voiceover is often used to, to invent a kind of radical and imperative subjectivity through which the narrative's own authority is undercut. We see this happening, of course, in uh, Old Humanist Kibia Macau. But this uh, lip syncing also recalls the dubbing that first made popular Asian genre cinema, especially Kung Fu and martial art films, available to the West. This is a quintessentially cinematic tool able to make dialogue both accessible and strange as a displaced voice. Um, here, Candy is a joyfully, brazenly bad actress, excessive in camp ways, not allowed in quality cinema. A kindred spirit, then, to camp and sex icon Jane Russell, star of the much maligned film, which essentially ended Joseph von Sternberg's Hollywood career. He wasn't even able to finish the film. That's why Nicholas Ray was brought on. And this is, of course, though, the inspiration for the title of Rodriguez and Gede de Matis' film. For while well, the moody and evocative title, Ultima Vis, could be a Macau, the last time I saw Macau, is itself emblematic of this, is, is itself emblematic of the same multiplicity of meanings that I think is so central to the film. 
We can, of course, read the title as speaking wistfully of João Ri Guerra de Mata's lost childhood, 30 years ago, we were told, when he last saw the city, he was last there. And yet, we could also read it as speaking of the last time someone, the unnamed I, saw on the Sternberg's film, Macau. The last time that I saw the minor, career-damaging, failed production that has over the years become affectionately embraced as a camp classic, in which von Sternberg's pre a predilection for ex expressive shadow and exoticized settings tears at the seam of the miserly budget given him by RKO. The last time I saw that now cherished vehicle for that deliciously bad actress, yet now ce celebrated icon of non-normative sexuality, Jane or Russell. The proud declaration of affinity to the film Macau can also be taken as an expression of openly queer cinephilia, which is driven, after all, by the ele elevation of the refused and even debased, an elevation into and transformation into a cult object. The camp sensibility uh, that gravitates towards the motif or minor work of the celebrated art, art, artists. Um, this is clearly the case with Von Stoneberg's Macau. Queer cinephilia also gives privileged place to an ultimate star system that elevates certain actors into the category of superstardom, be they truly established major stars like Betty Davis, Tyrone Power, or Marlene Dietrich, or minor players like Saul Mineo, uh, Vince Edwards, or of course, Jane Russell. It's a kind of uh, uh, leveling force here. To speak then of queer cinephilia is to speak in an alternate evaluation of cinema history, in an alternate way of reading films themselves. This idea of an alternate legibility of the image is key to Ultima Vesca via Macau and the different ways the film renders its image of Macau as drifting and open. One of the key devices of this openness of the film is the film's is the striking use of voiceover, which is again uh, 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 prepared for in this opening sequence. Of the voice applied upon images that often seem at times to resist it. Let's take a look at one of the countless examples that exist of this. Here we see the film through its voiceover to be claiming a kind of point of view which the images don't seem to uphold. The film's documentary images, indeed, seem to speak for themselves, calling attention to details that are not mentioned by the voiceover, which instead speaks of absences, of things that are not in the image, things that cannot be seen. If one were to turn the sound off, much of Macau would very much resemble a rather traditional documentary kind of a uh, lyrical observational film shot on the streets and waterways of the eponymous Asian city. This method uh, of, 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 of this, this strategy of, of the voice creates a curious effect of uh, making a foreground what appears at first to be a kind of background image. Here, loaded with details that constantly pull the viewer away from the film's ostensible narrative. I think this is a, this is a great example, one of the many uh, mannequins that appear throughout um, the Asian films. A further attention is playfully placed on the narrative by the constant emphasis on the images as being precisely the refusal of the film's narrative. Throughout the film, uh, Geta de Mata's hapless and rather incompetent detective is constantly complains of being ignored and lost in the labyrinthian streets. 
Justice's voice seems to be ignored and lost in the documentary images themselves. We can, of course, read this politically as even a critique of the colonialist project as an imposition of Western narrative upon the East. We can also read this as just one way in which the film reveals personal uh, projections and fantasy narratives as a shaping force of encounters between West and East, both in the cinema and in the popular imagination. Indeed, at one point in the film, uh, Geta the Mat is watching a Chinese opera, which he says he cannot understand. And he says, in watching it, though, he starts to think about and recall uh, childhood stories that he loved of pirates on the Chinese seas. With this in mind, we could even say that Macau in the film exists less as a place than as a displacement, a site upon which are projected seemingly endless series of different images and imaginations of Asia, different desires for Asia. And here we must again return to the topic of cinephilia as a mode of desire, of recapturing that which has been and will always will be lost. Cinephilia, then, is a mode of faulty memory, as errant and indeterminate, yet burnishing the same unexpected systematicity as individual and obsessive human desire. And especially striking here is the way in which Multi-University beyond Macau boldly juxtaposes different kinds of imagery of Macau, inter interweaving the so-called objective documentary footage gathered by Rodriguez and Guerra de Mata together with personal photographs, television documentaries, and of course Hollywood cinema. Key moment, I'll refer back to the that opening traveling shot, which uh colleague mentioned earlier, but here with the voice. Ela acreditava que esse era quase minha vida, né? Que eu era a única pessoa em quem ela ainda podia confiar. E ia me brigar no cabo, quando se estavam a passar coisas estranhas e assustadoras, segundo as suas próprias palavras. Gandhi tem instruções precisas sobre o local onde me deveria hospedar e sobre o como para não falar com ninguém sobre a minha vida. O meu nome é Guerra da Mata. Cansado, depois de muitas horas de voo, o próximo que me acabou agora do jet fora que me irá fazer regressar no tempo para o período mais feliz da minha vida. Isto é Natal, uma escola portuguesa que verdadeiramente nunca o foi. Singular e bizarra para uma encruzilhada de pessoas de raças e nacionalidades diferentes que aqui vêm tentar a sorte. Macau nunca para. É a cidade com a maior densidade populacional do mundo e também a cidade onde nos podemos sentir mais sós. Ok, so this clip reveals not only different kinds of images of Asia that are set into tension, but also different the different, often contesting voices the film also releases. So we have these, uh, we go from the footage shot by, uh, by the two filmmakers to footage from Macau, footage which is, should be pointed out is offered in the von Sternberg film as a documentary footage. This is footage offered the earlier film, so it's a, it's a fake documentary, we could say, um, that's, that's added to give, to anchor um, that fantasy of Macau in a kind of, in a kind of reality. So we're here seeing the sort of fragility, the thinness, the superficiality of that image, here especially within the degraded quality, uh, which is amplified, I say <laughs> this projection. Um, so, but it's also though, I think that the different voices that we're seeing here that's really important. Here we have the voices of the two filmmakers themselves, Geta the Mata speaking both as a detective hero of the film's noir fiction, and as the autobiographical hero returning to find his childhood, in search of his childhood, I should say. And then we also have uh, Rodriguez, meanwhile, speaking as the documentary voice. Less as the voice of God of classical documentary, but as a dispassionate, world-weary commentator, very much in the mode of Chris Marker. Take it from a strictly, and perhaps narrowly, and perhaps psychoanalytically informed auteur's point of view, the director's contest of voices, one which continues throughout the film, should I add, 
could be taken as a contest between two directors for the authorship of the film, for control of the narrative. Such a reading might find a curious echo in Mahjong, of course, where the two filmmakers play partners who end their relationship in a deadly duel with pistols. We can also, however, find other clues to the strategy when look in, in the director's other films. In, for example, get the Matis first and still only uh, solo, solo directorial work, Oke Adlipura, in which he appears at only as a voice on the telephone, another kind of playful self-effacement. And here, however, we can see something else at work, a playful yet rigorous tension between and almost uh, a, a kind of autonomy given to both a soundtrack and image track, a tension which reminds us always of the constructive nature of the cinematic image. This meta-cinematic dimension is particularly charged and constant, I think, across the Asian films. With this in mind, let's take a look at the first film in the series, which is, of course, Chin and Chin. confrontation of a Western-inspired image of the Asian hero, now embraced by, by China China's heroine, uh, is, it follows a strand that runs throughout the Asian films. This is a pointed refusal of the kind of Orientalist othering so central to Western cinema. I think the, the moment where um, Ultima Vesca via Macau seems, I think, to border the closest to a kind of Orientalist fantasy and almost sort of Fu Manchu uh, uh, element is this, this thread of the story of the zodiac cult uh, whose believers willfully transform themselves into animals. And yet, I think by seeing, uh, thinking about this in terms of, of, of Rodriguez and Guerra de Mato's films, we can realize that, that actual this, this, this is this, the place of the animal, the role of the animal, and its, its relation to uh, the human is actually part of a larger transformational like, prog uh, 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 logic in the films. And of course, uh, points, we could say, backwards to, um, to, to their very first film together, Parabéns, in which we see uh, the Matas, again, the Matas, a young, uh, unexpected lover, sort of co-mingling and becoming one with um, uh, the cat, uh, uh, Sonic. Um, 
Uh, or we could, we could think, as, as this is also anticipating or an ecologo, which perspective shifts the key moments between the animal and the human and the figures of birds that observe the film's hapless here are key moments. So the animals then are, are figures also of, 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 of a kind of commutation and, and oneness with the other. Um, it, this is a key and I think almost utopian thread running through Rodriguez's films. And we might speculate on a connection between this animal otherness and the mode of queer cinema explored by Rodriguez, but we also might think of it somehow in relation to, and just to offer this as a thought, to uh, uh, a kind of rebuttal and refusal of the sort of othering tradition uh, uh, standard to uh, the imagination of Asia in um, dominant cinema. In China China, the image of Asia is offered as a kind of currency that circulates uh, effortlessly, both transnationally, even finding its way here into the displaced Asian into the displaced Asian community of Lisbon, and interpersonally within individual and collective fantasy projections of cult unfulfilled desire. To speak of the circulation of images brings us back to Macau, the old university of Macau, which I think offers not only a catalog of different images of Asia but of the different vectors and paths through which images move. Yes, the film kaleidoscopes with different cinematographic images of the city, as you said, from Lumiere-style actuality to noir dystopia to science fiction, while also providing a very specific catalog of the different ways Asia has been imagined by the West, the anonymity of the crowd, the strangers of the different culture and language, think of Chris Marker, Blade Runner, and Black Rain. Uh, at the same time, however, the film and the Asian films as a, as a, as a total um, that accompany it also constantly remind us of the shifting, ever-changing value and movement of images, of images that can and do move differently and can move us differently in synchronicity with and as echoes of our own desire. Uh, the search, I think, within the film for a kind of utopian film that is able to expand and constantly uh, take new shape, that is able to contain a multiplicity of voices and perspectives while also contracting to render vivid and intimate the most personal stories and memories, um, a film that can be both a city symphony and a home movie, seemingly simultaneously, is the sort of charge, and I think Vector, which continues, to which the, the uh, other films of the series are offered in response. I'd like to close by looking at two films that I think that offer very specific responses to this. Uh, the first, Red Dawn, and the second, E.A. Blanc. Um, and let's take a look at uh, the opening of Red Dawn. Here, of course, again, when these films are seen as a, as a, uh, as a larger entity, as it were last night, as we showed them um, quite recently by the Harvard Film Archive, as they've been seen elsewhere, these kind of resonances emerge. Here, of course, the show from um, Macau, seemingly sim uh, strikingly similar to the shoe that Jane Russell throws, is also the shoe that uh, is the vital clue, offers a vital clue in both Mahjong and the last time I saw Macau. But we can note right away that the interest of this shot is not in the object which catches their eye, but is instead in the action that happens in the background. Again, this play of foreground and background that we see in the last time I saw Macau, here takes a different and charged form. What we're seeing here is, of course, that most uh, pro proto-cinematic of moments, the workers arriving at the factory. And Lumiere, of course, is the workers leaving the factory, but still, the representation of labor in cinema remains one of the uh, sort of most uh, profound and important, I think, uh, um, uh, images and, and, and topics in the point of which uh, uh, returns. The shoe, of course, could be one belonging to Antonio, the drag queen star of To Die Like a Man. Um, and yet, this is a clear symbol that, uh, that this world has somehow been left behind. I think it's striking as well that the film continues with a, a garbage truck, so we can get into the fruit too. Uh, the uh, El Fantasma. And then we have this wonderful extended scene, again, of the factory, the factory gates. The film 
continues, of course, we enter the, the, the factory, as I'm calling it, which is actually the market for uh, meat and fish. And we see, uh, uh, kind of, um, at times, uh, I just said, a very difficult imagery. We see animals being, being slaughtered and transformed into food. And I think here we can see, again, if we start to see these films as being in dialogue with one another and in dialogue with Rodriguez's work, we can see and we can understand important connections here. We can see here, for example, a further response then to the cult of animals uh, within the last time I saw Macau, but this time animals used in a different, more brutal uh, or ritual. Of course, uh, referenced here, uh, and sort of given another level, a meaning to is, is the cinema of George Franchu and Blood of the Beasts, um, and the surrealist idea of the strange, the seemingly unnatural emerging um, from the real. This is not a film from Squeamish, it was in fact censored as it was uh, premiered in China. Um, and the film though asks profoundly ethical questions about the documentary image. What does it mean to watch an actual death on a film? Um, this is the most extreme, I think, ethical question that we, can, we, that we can ask. And we see this again and again with the execution of the chickens that throw the slip and then drop it seemingly casually into plastic a uh, barrel that continues to twitch for the last uh, death throws. Um, at times, though, the film also clearly embraces and, and, and points towards the genre, uh, popular film genres at times. It seems to resemble a horror film with the close-ups of a bucket of blood almost splattered, uh, like, like a kind of abstract expressionist uh, painting. At times, the film seems to resemble a kind of unflinching documentary realist, realism pursued by purists such as Wang Bing as this, this extended shot that I, I showed as well. Yet I think the film also uh, makes a clear distance and point of distance, marks a clear distance from this kind of realism with a crucial addition of cinematic illusionism and I'm speaking here of course about spectacular highly sexualized uh, mermaids that are of course taken from the um, from the Macau Casino. We glimpsed them uh, briefly the last time I saw Macau. Um, the directors, of course, claimed their film as a critique of the flesh market of industrialized cinema production as emblematized by the Hollywood star Jane Russell, who um, was promoted as a star, uh, like many actresses, by Howard Hughes who, um, because of some personal, very um, individualistic fetishes that he had in his strange relationship with his actresses. Um, which he would essentially often uh, keep them, um, sort of as kept women, um, trapped in contracts which basically allowed, did not allow them to work for any other studios, but kept nevertheless on the law. And let's take a look then at the at Yek Long, which is one of the great films in the series. And Yek Long, of course, offers another kind of vision of a, of a factory, another, uh, um, and I should point out the fact that the market in Red Dawn is also the last, was at the time, the last market of its kind that, uh, where um, uh, meat was traditionally, and fish were traditionally prepared, and it was just about to, um, to close at the time. This is one of the reasons why um, uh, the Giraud wanted to, wanted to film it. And in the Ang Long, they discover another uh, site, uh, we could say a site, a uh, historic factory, and this is an abandoned uh, uh, firework factory, which makes its first appearance in the last time I saw Macau, where it appears as this as this setting for for the paint pellet game that, that uh, opens that film. Um, when I first saw the film in a previous screening before its uh, New York Film Festival premiere, a colleague and I remember questioned uh, Joel Paper Rodriguez about the title, and then I, and I remember saying I worried that it didn't have the same catch and pull as the other titles, and somehow this film seemed to be set aside. And, be marked differently. And then I realized that's exactly the point here. This is a film that I think refuses any kind of, of, of it marks a further distance um, and, and from the kind of exoticized image of, of, of Asia that the other films I think of, of, of engage. Um, and it does so in a, in a, at the same time while still containing the sort of, I think, uh, ideas of, sort of Asian and, and popular genre cinema. A ghost story, after all, um, as well. And let's take a, a look at, I think, one of the, the really charged moment. Unfortunately, this is not um, subtitled, so 
and another engagement with, uh, between the East and West, I'll, I'll narrate it in Benchy style. <laughs> so this is, this is a moment of the film, and many of us saw it last night, so I won't, I won't go on too much, in which um, it's discovered that the, that the caretaker of these ruins was in fact a, uh, a child worker at the firework factory by the name of Ian Long, that's the name of the film itself. Um, and in this moment, he is speaking of uh, the conditions at the factory, how the, the fact that there are many young children, sometimes as young as six years old, he was eight at the time, who are working under quite uh, difficult conditions. Um, because of the small and agile fingers, they were given the job of inserting fuses into the fireworks. This was, of course, dangerous work that often resulted in, in, often in, in death. This footage is of course shot on Super 8, this is why this squawker hole is, is, is so Those walls, of course, were there to protect uh, when there be explosions inside these uh, uh, factory uh, spaces. Those, those walls were supposed to limit the, uh, the explosion, not necessarily to save human lives, but to rather to protect the, 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 the actual property itself. Now he's speaking about the fact that they never questioned the condition of the work, um, but rather accepted it um, because there was no other Now he speaks about the labels that were on the fireworks themselves that have fascinated him as a young boy. And he said he set in his imagination a flame, much like in Get Up the Mountain speaks of the pirate stories. So in here we can see a different kind of melding of our different uh, modes of different, different, different kinds of, of imagery. They're very different, I think, in, in charge to to to, to such a, um, uh, different in charge uh, 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 direction. Here, we're turning pointedly to a site that had been used for a kind of fantasy projection to be used as a prop, as a, as a, as, as, as a background setting for a fantasy uh, noir uh, narrative. Here, being uh, treated with a kind of a different uh, a kind of, of objective, different kind of lens, a sort of critical uh, archaeology determined to discover the true story of what actually happened and how lives were lived in this, in this very particular uh, place, being um, 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 Macau, this, this particular factory. This is an interest then not in a, a, a universalized or, or a fantasy Macau, but Macau is a specific historic location. Um, rather than a, a narrative character, we're here we're seeing an individual uh, uh, whose story has never been told. An individual in this case who seems to look at us uh, uh, and to ask us to try to see everything uh, differently. 
I love the way that this film also though, insists on still interweaving a kind of playful fantasy in this kind of quite haunting one. These figures of the ghosts played by, by the young uh, boys here, and also the animation of the letters themselves. There's an insistence here on the sort of unique potential of cinema as, the, as a mode of historical inquiry, able to animate the sort of imagination of a place. Uh, imagination, in this case, not only of us, the spectators, but here of the subject itself. Um, this old man, like Shrove, about uh, the Mata looking back at his childhood, and that's another way which I think we can and should see this film as a response to Uti Ares, the young Macau. I'll have to hear it so we can maybe take some questions. Mm -hmm. Naquilo que estava a dizer há pouco, nas várias intersecções que nós podemos estabelecer, atualmente, portanto, nestes últimos anos, a questão do documentário ganha tonalidades uh, diferentes. Ganha essas mesmas tonalidades diferentes, ou pelo contrário, em Portugal, ou pelo contrário, há muito mais um tipo de europeização uh, do documentário português em termos uh, mais globais, mais gerais, o tipo de trabalho que se faz com a Câmara, uh, dos conhecimentos técnicos que se tem, da relação uh, muito mais rápida com outro tipo de, de formas uh, de exposição. E que, que, uh, quem sabe uma das figuras mais importantes neste momento em que e eu estava a pensar, pronto, teve um tipo de trabalho, por exemplo, António, do João Canicho e com o Sim. trabalho que ele faz com o pequeno uh, documentário do António Lopes de Guarda. Sim. 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 Mas uma, então, a pergunta é qual é, se podemos ver antes um tipo de intersexual entre e não sei se é. Sim. Um antes e um depois, ou, 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 ou há, há, logicamente, Sim. cargas ideológicas. Sim. Mas há também uma certa continuidade em termos de um tipo de, 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 de género que vai continuar, que vai aparecer, que vai sendo, no fundo, até uh, quase que apoiado em termos Sim. dos vários regimes políticos, Sim. em termos, uh, por exemplo, não tanto passando para o cinema, mas para a televisão, 
é a parceira, a parceira pela própria televisão pública todo um tipo de apoio a este tipo de documentários mais curtos, portanto mais limitados com determinado tipo de objetivos diferentes, mas vai, vai, vai continuar a existir e estes realizadores não estou agora a, a, estou a pensar em termos de continuidade alguns destes realizadores nomeadamente alguns dos realizadores uh, por exemplo para, da, da, da televisão são depois também a paz no fundo Uh, realizadores de cinema, muito mais circunscrita, até porque não têm tanto dinheiro. E uh, uh, aquilo que eu lhe perguntava, porque tem feito no fundo esse tipo de visão, quase macro, historiografando, não é? Estudiando essa parte, uh, se há ou não continuidade, se há ou não este tipo de diálogo uh, de, das novas correntes, de, de, portanto, dos nossos. De, dos, dos novos. Sim, sim. Uh, passado. Sim. E, exatamente. Sim. Que tipo de relação, que tipo de voz que é com ou não é com ou não, que novidades é que existe? É uma... Pegando no seu conceito de sinfilidade. Sim, sim, sim. Não, eu, não, é, para mim, eu acho que quando eu falo de cinefilia, a cinefilia truly begins, eu acho que um argumento que a classic cinefilia begins with the death of, with the end of classical cinema, right? And so I, and I feel like the place that within a documentary within that, I mean, I think is it really is, or the relationship I think is really interesting. I mean, there is a kind of, I feel like because of, precisely because of different, um, uh, 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 in some countries, in some kind of documentary production continues in a more classical mode, I think for a longer period. So this is, And you know, in the States, this is true. I think within uh, certain modes of, uh, of television and newsreel, but it, it gradually does. There's a loss, but there's a period in which there's a certain, I think, overlapping, or perhaps a kind of classicism is, is, is and of course there are exceptions that are really, that are really in, um, important. I mean, I think it's interesting in Portuguese cinema to trace, for example, like uh, the sort of iconic images, films about, them, for instance, the fisherman. Right, and like the many, there's a whole genre of sort of fishing film. I think that's one interesting way to gauge exactly that kind of, 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 of question, because it's also one we think about Paulo Rocha and the Viva, you know, which is, I mean, it's actually something that because of the interest in the novel and the working class, it's, it's there. I think there's a really charged sort of tension and attempt to sort of renovate and bring something new at the same time to be to have. So, so the, the, it's things like that that are really interesting. I mean, how does that relate to, I mean, it, something else that interests me, I should say, in Portuguese cinema, though, is it's outside during this, the ways in which, for various reasons, it's, I think this is its, its richness, its strength, it's like there's, there's a kind of, 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 of um, and I feel like this is why the films, of, of, to me, that speak in many different levels to more than just a specific project, these film series of Asian films, but they speak to kind of critical distance that I think the Portuguese film is able to achieve by, I think, a sort of outsiderness. And again, that's a huge generalization, but I, I feel like you can see that in the key, in the key work of filmmakers. Again, like like, like Olivia, or like, you know, Jean César Monteiro, who's an outsider in so many ways, and willfully so, but not want to be part of any, you know, <laughs> any medical, uh, I don't I mean, quando quando falava a propósito até do da última vez que Macau falava de utopia e Displays uh, uh, relativamente, uh, não apenas, mas a esse uh, em particular. Eu perguntava, e até atendendo àquela aquela ideia da arte uh, e das várias relações entre os, os cineastas portugueses, uh, uh, que, como é que via essas mesmas categorias uh, na cinematografia do, do Paulo Rocha e, em particular, das, das duas ideias. I mean, the idea of utopia, displacement. I mean, to me, again, I think Ayelid and Marais is a key film there because it, it's, 
you know, and, and the way in which, like the Asian film, the sense that you know, of not wanting to allow, or just saying that multiplicity, the, the insisting on a kind of multiplicity of perspectives. I mean, it's something that's interesting what I speak that figures the two, the two women themselves, but the way that Rosha insists that this other film, that somehow his bio, his Ayurveda of Samoris had not somehow, it had, it had not grasped at something essential. And so I feel like that to me is the sense of, of, of you know, the idea of this, this sort of faith, nevertheless, in a kind of documentary, and again, a kind of documentary that is able to reach a kind of truth, and get not declared as such, because the film ends so open ended To me, I feel like this is a sort of, as I say, I mean, utopian is a big word, but I feel like that's this idea that, yes, cinema can approximate, can come closer to this, these different kinds of modes of cinema can come closer to different kinds of truth. Here, one that though immediately refracts and becomes as well a reflection of the Russian stuff. So I find like, again, I think, I feel though, in this acknowledgement of that, this idea of, this, of, of multiple and shifting perspectives, I think is, is, a, is a pretty radical and one that's rarely, uh, 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 I think, embraced so openly as I feel like it's constantly done. I think of, again, of the thing about Montero, the way he himself takes that role back to the way by his end it becomes the story of his approaching death as well. You know, it's like, so again, I feel like this kind of displacement, if you will, from character to, right, to, to, to director, to, to so, so. Uh, would you say it's possible to, to state that in Portugal the way um, Portuguese filmmakers deal with history is a very specific one in so far as uh, it's uh, like, um, well, although in general, in general, in different ways according to each filmmaker, but there's a, a, a similar tendency to transform history and specifically Portuguese history into a, some kind of um, a mythification of history that can be uh, understood as a self-reflection uh, right. lo locus. <laughs> Would no, you say I, it's possible to say that? I think, I mean, I think what, I, what I'm trying to describe is the tendency of Gypsy and Gen and Keith filmmakers not profit is actually this intertwining of right, the mythic and the history. I mean, again, those are both slippery categories, and once you get into, you know, Bay Alfonso or something like that, then it's like, where's the separation? There really isn't any. But that's, I think, exactly the point. I mean, and also the way in which the filmmakers like Montero will be there to name the history, you treat literature as history, as a kind of historical lens, right? And so they're seeing fiction, or, I mean, the um, Oliveira's film by Christopher Columbus, right? Where he enters into speculative uh, So it's, I think it's clearly like, this is, this is, a really important um, current, without a doubt. And the point, the question is though, like, at what point does that become history, right? I mean, that's, that's what's interesting. I mean, this is something that, you know, I, I uh, this is why it's so important to study the films of the past, like to study even the most, as you know, many of you have here, looking at the, you know, films that we've always had, you know what I mean, because they do start to take on the kind of, of gravity and things like this. But, with these key Portuguese films, the idea is though is to, to destabilize, right? To leave something there that's so highly personal, that's so you know, that it actually allows it not just to become like a monument or something like God with the window or something. You know what I mean? It's so I think that that's that's part of it, you know, and that has a lot that's where the role of ambiguity is so is so important. Uh, e então espero uh, ver-vos também na, na sessão agora.